Hi, we're here in Glasgow at ESHG 2015 and we're talking about a method that helps with rare allele detection. Can you tell me a little bit about digital PCR and, you know, what's the technique? So digital PCR is the next generation qPCR technique. So what we do is we take the um, fluid, which is your qPCR mix, and we spread it across a very large number of partitions. And what happens in the process is um, some, some of those partitions will get the target of your interest, some of those partitions will not get the target of your interest. And then once you amplify, there will be through holes that have not got the signal because they haven't gotten the target of your interest. And we can apply statistics to that in order to um, in order to quantitate for the target of your interest. Now, how it helps rare allele analysis or rare t mutation analysis is that uh, because of this process of uh, splitting up your core sample into a large number of um, partitions, within a single through hole, it, the chance of a rare uh, allele becoming isolated is much higher. And also the in through hole ratio of the rare allele to the wild type allele is much more enhanced. And this allows the rare target a much higher chance of amplifying and therefore for our detection. And so therefore, the digital pre-CR technique has a lot of promise for rare mutation analysis. That's great. And uh, I, I see that you have a poster here at ESHG. Can you tell me a little bit about your poster? Sure, sure. Um, so this is a rare event that we are interested in, right? And which means there are these one or two or three points. We want to make sure that they are real positives and they're not um, false positives. So uh, what I've seen done in a lot of the work that's currently coming out with digital PCR is people will take, people will run a wild type control and the positive control and they will try to kind of um, partition up the, uh, the, thing, the space, the fluorescent space into, okay, this zone is wild type only, that zone, anything outside of that zone is actually your true positives. And that's how they try to go about it. But the problem, the weakness of this method is that um, we are assuming there is no run-to-run -run variation. What I'm proposing in this poster makes you resistant to the fact that there can be run-to-run -run variation. Well, what I'm doing is you have the um, non-amplification non cluster and you have the wild-type positive cluster and note that both of this cluster have a significant membership so it's very easy to determine their center, even automated, nobody has to manually intervene. Um, and once you have automated those centers, you can model those two clusters with a two-dimensional Gaussian and then use the statistics of those two main clusters to determine which are the points that do not belong with that cluster. And that's a much more reliable way to detect, you know, on your wild type chip, you know. So what I've done is uh, I have this model, this equation, uh, which, which does this and I have put a threshold on above what probability, you know, from, from doing analysis over, of a lot of data, I've picked a threshold over, beyond of which I know that these points don't belong with the main cluster. And how I've proved that this method works is I've taken this, uh, this data which has 110.1% one um, mut rare mutant to wild type concentrations and I've applied my method. Assume this was a wild type chip, then what would you quantitate, how many false positives would you find? And as you can see, I would expect it to find everything that is actually rare in this case, right? So I am manually annotating what is the quantity and then I'm applying my method to quantitate it and I'm showing you that they are pretty same, so which means that the method is working um, and is able to determine the wild positive threshold for number of wild, uh, false positives that you're finding um, on your wild type control. And once you know for your assay system what's that number that you're finding, you can back calculate and say, okay, this is the minimum number of false positives uh, or true positives I need to see in order to start believing the result. So you can come up with a lower threshold and you know that makes uh, life much easier for our scientists who are interested in rare mutation because they don't want to be tripped by false positives. They want to know when what they're seeing is for real. Right. That sounds really interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you.